Good afternoon, everyone. A very warm welcome to all of you. I'm Karen Donfrey, GMF's president, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this installment of Transatlantic Talks. We are delighted to have as our guest today David McAllister. He is a member of the European Parliament, and he is the Parliament's chairman for the Delegation for Relations with the United States. And while this is our fourth transatlantic talk, it is our very first one with a member of the European Parliament. So we're particularly delighted to welcome you today, because also we very much recognize the important role that the European Parliament plays on everything from negotiations on transatlantic trade and investment partnership to data privacy, and on so many more issues. So it's wonderful to be having a voice from Brussels as part of this series. Given the European Parliament elections earlier this year, the fact that you have a new European Commission, a new European Council President, a new High Representative for Foreign Policy, there also clearly are a lot of key topics to discuss from Brussels as well. And what's wonderful about this Transatlantic Talk series is it pairs a senior official, in this case from Europe, with a journalist from the other side of the Atlantic. And we're so delighted that Molly McCluskey is here today to round out this conversation. Molly is a freelance foreign correspondent whose work has appeared in lots of illustrious publications. So we're delighted to have her. And I should say also that part of David McAllister's past that you will be familiar with is that he had a very distinguished career in German politics before moving to Brussels. Most recently, he was the minister president, or in, in American parlance, the governor of the state of Lower Saxony, representing Chancellor Merkel's party, the Christian Democratic Union. And so he clearly has this distinguished past, but I, as GMF president, have to say that nothing is more important in his past to us than the fact that he was one of our Marshall Memorial Fellows. Yeah. And as an alum <laughs> of that program, I am particularly pleased to be welcome, welcoming David McAllister here today. And I will note that we will have a countryman of his here next week, and that is Germany's Minister of Food and Agriculture, Christian Schmidt, who will be telling us about the joys of negotiating TTIP, dealing with food and <laughs> agriculture issues in Germany. So you can all mark your calendars to come back next Wednesday, December 10 at 3 p.m. for that. But today, we are just so delighted to be discussing issues relevant to the transatlantic relationship as seen from Brussels. And with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to Molly. Thanks Wonderful. so much to both of you. Thank you, Karen, so much for having us. And David, it's always nice to see you. Uh, and for those of you who are joining us via the live stream or on Twitter or watching this later on YouTube, we're really glad you're here with us today. And it's so wonderful to be here at the German Marshall Fund, especially <laughs> discussing the EU Parliament elections and the status of Parliament and what that means for transatlantic talks and relationships. And especially since we had those uh, very interesting elections in May, and I know the concern at the time was with the elections of officials from both far right and far left parties, how that would really play out and impact both Europe and the transatlantic talks and our relationships. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience with where Parliament is right now at this moment? Well, the elections took place on the 25th of May and Parliament started work on the 1st of July. The first thing we did was to elect Mr. Jean-Claude Juncker as the new President of the Commission. That was a very important day for the European Union because for the first time we had Spitzenkandidaten at the European elections. That um, means that most of the political parties in Europe presented their candidates who were supposed to become Commission President if they become the strongest group. Uh, so that was something new in the European Union, and I think that is something which cannot be reversed. Um, I mean, apart from the United Kingdom, all countries more or less agreed to uh, the Spitzenkandidaten process being a sensible idea. Um, afterwards, you know, the Parliament started work. Uh, we have now elected the whole Commission uh, into office, all the other 27 Commissioners. Mr. Tusk is now the president of the council, so we can really start work now, and we've got a lot of things to do. There's a lot of things uh, on our plate. Um, the elections on the 25th of May saw an increase of the far right and the far left. 
but not as much as had been predicted by some observers. Uh, of course, from a German point of view, it's worrying that in France, which is our most important ally, the Front National became the strongest political party, a party which wants to get France out of the European Union as soon as possible, wants to destroy the idea of a united Europe. Of course, we weren't happy that UKIP became the strongest political party uh, in the United Kingdom, but that, I think, had a lot to do with a very low turnout uh, on the British Isles. But on the other hand, I would say 70, 75, nearly 80 percent of the members of the European Parliament are on a constructive way. They want to reform the European Union, they want to make the European Union stronger, and we perhaps don't have a grand coalition in the European Union, but we have a cooperation between the Christian Democrats, the EPP on the one side, the centre, the centre-right political parties, and the Social Democrats on the other side, and uh, in a lot of um, uh, issues of the Liberals and parts of the Green Party join us. So usually Mr Juncker on the whole commission, they got about 450 uh, votes. So that's really the Juncker coalition which is working and then we've got the opposition from the far right and the far left. You mentioned the UK and I know it's been a very exciting year uh, in the United Kingdom. Not only with the conversation you know, about whether or not the UK will is served by being part of the European Union, whether it should stay part of the European Union. There's both sides of that, of course, but also the Scottish referendum and whether or not Scotland would stay part of the United Kingdom itself. So how is the role of the United Kingdom within the European Union at this moment? Is it still strong? Well, this is a tricky one. Uh, McAllister isn't really a very German surname. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm half British, half German. I was born as a Brit. My father served with the British military in Germany and he's actually from Glasgow, so I'm half British, Scottish, half German. Well, the Scottish referendum has been decided. My position was always that is a question the people of Scotland have to decide. And uh, the referendum was agreed between London and Edinburgh, and both sides knew that they would then accept the result. So that is over and done with, at least in the meantime. And now with regards to the future of the United Kingdom and the European Union, I think we've just got to wait what will happen at the British elections in May next year. Mm -hmm. Prime Minister Cameron has announced that if he stays in power, if the Conservatives can continue their government, he wants to put the question if the United Kingdom should stay in the European Union or not to a referendum to all the British people within the first two and a half years of the next election period. So we're talking about a possible referendum in the end of 2017. Now we've just got to wait what exactly will happen in the United Kingdom but from a German point of view I would always say we want the British to stay in the European Union. We can discuss a number of questions and we know that some issues are very important to the politicians in London. Of course you can have a European Union without the United Kingdom, but it certainly wouldn't be a better uh, European Union. We need the British, uh, and especially we Germans want the British to stay because they are our, one of our closest allies when it comes to economic reforms, when it comes to making the European Union more effective, and of course we also need the British as a bridge to the United States of America. So I think the next two and a half years might be quite exciting. Uh, in the United Kingdom. Once again, the people in Britain will decide, um, but the people in England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland will decide, and hopefully uh, they will then decide that um, the United Kingdom stays in the European Union. In the meantime, we'll just have to wait what exactly the British expect from the European Union. They're talking about a more flexible Europe, or well, let's wait and see what exactly they mean. Mm -hmm. And while conversations in the UK about whether or not to leave the EU continue, of course there are other countries that are looking to get into the EU. I know we talked a little bit about Serbia earlier and their role in enlargement as well as several of the other former Yugoslavian countries. Do you, what is your take on enlargement at this point? I know there was some discussion that Croatia would be the last one for a while, but it sounds like that might not be as firm a statement as it was in the past. Well, the European Union isn't a closed shop. Uh, any European country which shares our values and which fulfills the criteria uh, put down to paper in Copenhagen can, can eventually become a member of the European Union. 
Uh, Jean-Claude Juncker said in his inaugural speech in, in Strasbourg that there won't be new member states of the European Union within the next five years. And I mean, he said something which is common sense. I don't see any country which we are negotiating with in the moment to be ready in the next five years. I mean, in the moment we're actually only talking to Turkey, Serbia and Montenegro. Uh, Iceland have cancelled the negotiation talks. They might have been a candidate to join within the next five years, but we've got to respect the decision of the, um, uh, the, the government in Iceland. So Serbia, well, personally I think that Turkey is a very special question. But apart from Turkey, I always underline that the Western Balkans have a clear European perspective. The Western Balkan countries are an important part of Europe. They're proud nations. And how can somebody in Brussels or elsewhere say that these proud European nations shouldn't be able to become members of the European Union? So with regards to Serbia, and I'm the rapporteur for Serbia in the European Parliament, I've been dealing with Serbian politics for the last eight weeks now, uh, every day. Uh, I would say the Serbian train towards Europe is on track. But it will take a number of years until this train uh, reaches uh, Brussels' main station. But in the meantime, we should assist Serbia. We should help them. We should encourage them to do their reforms. And I'm pretty sure that the first chapter will be, the first negotiation chapter will be opened uh, next year. There are 35 chapters the Commission is dealing with, with the Serbian government. Um, and in Serbia, once again, it's fundamentals first. First, we've got to talk about the independence of the judiciary, fighting corruption, fighting organized crime, the reform of the public administration, a good economic governance. These are the main important questions Serbia has to deal with first. And of course, a special question in Serbia is to normalize the relations between Pristina and Belgrade. That's something where the German federal government, especially Chancellor Merkel, pays a lot of attention to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And speaking of Serbia and, and some of the other Eastern European countries, many of which have varying levels of engagement with the EU, either they're members or they're not, or they're looking to join, or um, some are on the Euro, some are not. What role do you see Eastern Europe at large playing with some of the security concerns now with Russia and the EU? Well, first of all, one of the main uh, tasks for the new European Commission will be to reshape neighborhood policy. Um, I don't think the concept of one size fits all works in neighborhood policy. We've got different types of cooperation, and we've got to look at each country in the eastern neighborhood as well as in the southern neighborhood very differently. Uh, in the moment, uh, the main issues are to have stability and cooperation agreements with Moldova, uh, Georgia, and Ukraine. Uh, these are the three uh, important countries uh, in the neighborhood policy. Uh, I've already talked to you about the enlargement uh, policy, Serbia and Montenegro. The negotiation talks have started. Albania is waiting. Uh, for the negotiation uh, talks to officially be opened. Bosnia and Kosovo are two tricky mm -hmm. uh, candidates and um, we have a lot of problems, but we also have a responsibility. By the way, a responsibility not only in Europe, but also in the United States of America, who also uh, have, of course, their role to play, with re especially with regards to Bosnia or, or Kosovo. And then we, of course, have a country uh, south of, or um, well, north of Greece, um, some call it Macedonia, other call it Phyrum. Uh, I'm completely neutral, so it's Phyrum. Uh, any Greeks here? Then, um, uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, but, but really, this country, um, uh, uh, you know, is blocked because of a name issue for so many years now, and I just wish we could find a bit of, make a bit of progress eventually, because they're waiting for years now. And for years we're getting the answer. We can't agree on which name we can give you. Um, that's, that's really tough. Um, of course, security is 
plays a much bigger role now because of what happened in Ukraine. Um, I'm together with Eastern European colleagues every week and it's really interesting to hear what they're saying. You know, what happened in Ukraine raised a lot of concern all over the world. But you can imagine that countries very close to Russia mm -hmm. see it even more with a worrying perspective. The Romanians are closely looking at what's happening in Moldova. And our Polish friends, of course, are looking very closely at what's happening in Ukraine. Or just think what uh, our friends from the Baltic states are worried about what could happen. And of course, talking about security, as it's getting colder for us, it's also getting colder in Europe as well, of course. And energy security and, and meeting the needs, of course, not only through the winter, but year round, is becoming an increasing concern. Are these issues that you're working with? I know each country is looking at diversifying their energy sources in different ways. Some are increasing nuclear, some are increasing coal. I mean, it varies by country. What are you seeing as the energy security policy? Do you see a cons consolidated one coming across? Well, Commission President Juncker uh, and uh, others have made very clear that energy will be one of the top priorities within the European Union in the next five years. We have to cooperate more closely within the European Union uh, on the field of energy policy. The single market uh, you know, is the core of the European Union and we've got the single market in a number of political fields but in other uh, parts. We're just at the beginning and certainly in energy we've got a lot to do to cooperate more closely, you know, to build the grid, uh, to build pipelines uh, and, and other things. And our, apart from a lot of other goals, one thing is very important. We've got to reduce the dependency of certain EU countries from energy imports because uh, that has we now see that that can be a major political problem. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but, but this isn't only a question within the European Union, but it's of course also an issue of transatlantic relations between the United States and the European Union. Mm -hmm. In general, I would say the main challenges we've got to face in the European Union, Union now are first, jobs and growth. Europe has to become more competitive. The second main challenge is do concrete things to encourage growth and to create new jobs. That means we've got to finish the single market, free trade with other parts of the world, especially the United States of America. We've got to reindustrialize Europe. The third main task is more financial stability. Our joint currency, the euro has to become stable in the long term. That means we've got to do a lot of more uh, structural reforms within the member states, especially within the member states of the Eurozone. Banking union uh, is something which will come. And perhaps finally, I really like a sentence Mr. Barroso once said, Europe should be bigger on big things and smaller on small things. The European Union should concentrate on the big issues which the member states can't solve on their own. But on the other hand, the European Union should give the member states room to take their own decisions on other political fields, on the national level, at the regional level, and also at the local level. So subsidiarity and proportionality to main principles of the European Union, I think they have to be respected more by the Commission and also by the Parliament in the next few years. And speaking of within the next few years, talk to me a little bit about a broader vision for the European Union, say, within the next two years or within the next five years. What do you see some of the challenges that can be overcome easily, some that might take a little bit more time? Well, in the moment, we've got to get our priorities right. And the, the number one priority is the economy. It's growth and jobs. And once again, Europe has to become more competitive. Uh, we have a far too high rate of unemployment, especially in southern Europe. Uh, youth unemployment will be a serious threat if it remains at these far too high numbers. So all member states have to do their structural reforms. All member states have to try hard to balance their budgets. 
It's all been agreed uh, within the uh, Pact for Stability and Growth. Uh, these rules apply to all 28 member states. Uh, we can't have exceptions, neither for smaller countries nor for larger countries. Uh, we're all in this together. So it's about structural reforms, getting the economy more competitive. Um, the European Union will play its part with the investment program, which Mr. Juncker announced last week. The single market is of vital importance uh, and also uh, free trade agreements. We should concentrate our investments in Europe on, it, on fields like infrastructure, energy and research. So that's really what we've got to do the next few years. Apart from that, we will have to discuss British proposals, if we want to or not, uh, in the next few years how to make the European Union more effective um, and we Germans are open for British proposals as long as they work and as, as long as uh, you can make them work within the treaties because you know treaty change is a rather tricky uh, question uh, to answer. Um, as a German Christian Democrat you won't be surprised uh, I believe that the European Union is more than the single market the European Union for me is a community of values, of shared values. The European community is a big project of peace and liberty. And we still believe in the idea of an ever closer union. That means the political union, which is something of large importance for us in Germany. Uh, not everyone in London will agree uh, on this question. Um, and I think that within the, we will probably get a more flexible European Union that those member states who want to move forward and cooperate more closely, they should have the chance to go forward and others might join us a little later. And if people say, well, how should more flexible Europe work? It's already working. Look, um, the Euro is the best example. 18 member states of the European Union have now introduced the joint currency. Some are planning to introduce the, new, uh, the joint currency in the next few years. Others like Britain and Denmark don't want to. Or look at Schengen. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't have border controls within 22 member states of the European Union. As a German, I would like to see all 28 member states join the Schengen area. But before waiting until the last government is ready to join, 22 went ahead and six are still waiting to join us. So perhaps we will get more flexibility in other parts uh, of the uh, European project. But once again, the four principles of the single market, uh, you can't change them. You know, the free movement of people, uh, goods, uh, and so on. Um, so once again, with re looking at the British debate, can we improve migration and immigration within the European Union? I would say yes. Can we change the fundamental right of free movement within the European Union? I would say no. So those are some ambitious goals for the EU you've just, you've just lined out for Oh, us. I could tell you more. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you could. Uh, but speaking of some of those goals, how do you see the transatlantic relationship helping or hindering the process the EU is looking to make within the next two, five, or ten years? Well, I'm very honored to, to become the chair of the uh, EU-US delegation, the European Parliament, as one of the new uh, MEPs. Um, and I'm delighted uh, to, to serve in this position. Uh, I strongly believe in the transatlantic friendship between the United States and Canada uh, and the Europeans. Uh, we might not agree on every issue, but the Americans are the best partners for us Europeans in the world. We share the same values, we're democracies, and um, as a German, uh, I will never forget that without uh, the courage of the Americans, uh, we wouldn't have been uh, liberated from National Socialist dictatorship. That's why Germans should also always be very thankful what the Americans did, not only liberating us from the National Socialist dictatorship with all the 
terrible things which happened in the name of Germany, but also helping to rebuild West Germany after the Second World War. And we also remember that the Americans were really the first in 1989-1990 who gave us a green light for reunifying uh, with uh, Eastern Germany. So I strongly believe in the German-American friendship. I strongly believe in the uh, transatlantic relations. And we will have the next transatlantic legislators' dialogue with members from the European Parliament on the one side and members of Congress on the other side uh, in April. And I will meet my American counterparts tomorrow. And we will discuss which issues we want to put uh, on the agenda. But it's pretty obvious we will be talking about security, energy security, and of course, the main issue now, TTIP. David, I know I have many more questions I could ask you, but I also think this audience does as well. I believe we have a microphone. Are there any questions? Um, who would like to go first? Yes. Please identify yourself. Um. I think if you'll wait for the mic for one second. Thank you. Hi, I'm Brett Fortnum from Inside US Trade. Um, one of the major um, points with TTIP has been that it's going to enhance the geopolitical relationship between the EU and US. Um, and I was wondering um, if that uh, if ar argument really um, carries as much weight in the European Parliament as it does in the US Congress. And if that argument is enough to outweigh uh, different issues such as ISDS and Gornet Chicken and all, all, you know the, these array of um, walls that the negotiations have hit thus far? Well, I believe uh, in the big chances TTIP can offer, both sides. Uh, I think TTIP um, is a great opportunity to create jobs on both sides of the Atlantic and to create uh, economic growth, and that's exactly what we need in Europe. Of course, there are a lot of questions which haven't been answered. There are a number of risks, but that's what negotiations are about. And in the moment, um, I would say uh, the Commission and the US authorities should continue negotiating. And once uh, they're ready with the negotiation, when, once we see the results, then we can uh, start um, a political debate in detail. Something for sure, TTIP is more than just about trade. Uh, TTIP for us is a geostrategic project. And um, I mean, it's a fascinating idea that the two largest economies in the world, the American and the European single market, merge to one big transatlantic single market. That would have a great impact on, on both sides of the Atlantic. So that's why, in general, I'm in favor of TTIP. But of course, we've got to discuss different views on certain questions. Um, there's a large amount of concern, especially within my country, Germany, when it comes to a few details. Um, the chlorinated chicken is one of the most famous uh, animals uh, in Germany in the moment. And I, I completely understand. Oh, look, I'm speaking to my constituents every day. And I get a lot of questions uh, on these issues. And we in Europe have high standards when it comes to consumer protection, protecting the environment, uh, protecting uh, laborers, um, uh, cultural stand standards and other things. But you in America have your standards too. And that's what negotiations are about. We've got to find a good compromise where both sides uh, can live with. So um, I think um, the negotiators are doing a good job. And I'm happy that Mrs. Malmström, the new commissioner for these questions, is coming to Washington, I guess, next week. Uh, important is transparency. You've got to inform the members of parliament on both sides of the Atlantic about all the steps which are being debated. And of course, since TTIP raises such big public concern, uh, you also have to address the people uh, in the United States and also in the 28 member states of the European Union. It's too early to really go into detail yet However, um, it's not a surprise if I say as a German that investor state dispute settlement uh, will be a rather controversial question. 
I understand the American position that they want or that they insist uh, on uh, having some kind of safeguards for uh, investors uh, within uh, the TTIP agreement. Um, on the other hand, um, we've also got to see that uh, we don't want ISDS interfere with an independent judiciary system in Europe, I think in the end we will have to find a balanced compromise. And that's what politics is always about. Gentleman in the back, please wait for the mic. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Jim Berger from Washington Trade Daily. Uh, I just have sort of a follow-up to that in a more general scope. There's a, a growing... Uh, I guess feeling on this side of the Atlantic that the European public is simply losing interest in TTIP. Uh, and even the U.S. Trade Representative have, has recently said, well, we got to get Europe back to the high uh, level and ambition that uh, this all started with. Uh, what, what's your opinion of that? Well, I'd say the public interest in Europe on TTIP is huge. It's enormous. I mean, if, if, if you're a member of the European Parliament, you don't really complain about getting uh, little enough emails. Uh, uh, um, I mean, I think, what was it? The, um, it was 700,000 uh, signatures against TTIP uh, during the hot phase of the election campaign in Germany. So uh, TTIP is all, always an issue. Wherever, I, when I'm, wherever I'm in Germany speaking to the people, uh, yeah, the German papers are full of TTIP nearly every day. Uh, so that's the one thing. On the other hand, uh, there's a clear commitment of all the national governments and the European Parliament as well, with a broad majority. We see the chances and we see uh, the, the positive aspects of a free trade agreement with the United States of America. And that's why we're working on these questions. That's why the negotiation process uh, is, is going on. Um, I think the difference is in America, you're not only talking about TTIP, but also about TPP, and I think that can gets more media coverage uh, in this part of the world uh, than in Europe. Um, so, for instance, my Chancellor Angela Merkel is very clear uh, uh, on TTIP, and we will have our National Party Conference uh, as CDU in Cologne next week, and you will hear some very clear messages once again from our Chancellor um, on, on, on this issue. And if you look what Mr. Tusk, what Mr. Tusk told your President yesterday, he spoke about TTIP and that we are interested in getting on with the negotiations in 2015. Uh, President Obama will have to make a decision if he wants to give this project uh, trade promotion authority or not. So. Oh, I mean, if you invite a German Christian Democrat, you won't be so <laughs> surprised that I'm generally in favor of TTIP. Sir, in the front here. I think East German uh, communists would probably see it a bit differently. Uh, Jeffrey Schott with the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Uh, let me impose upon one more question uh, on, on, on this issue of uh, investor state. Uh, you explained very well, and I think you're right to have uh, faith in the negotiators in coming up with a compromise uh, if they are given the chance to do so. But it seems to me that you could inform us uh, 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 better uh, than we're getting here in Washington on how European politicians can reach a compromise. Because it seems to me the problem is there is a existing negotiating mandate that includes the negotiation of ISDS provisions, and yet there are a number of governments, including the German government and the French government, that insist on not including it. Uh, how I is there a process that can move towards a compromise in terms of the European position, or how does the European politics work uh, uh, to allow the negotiators to do their work? Well, at the moment, ISDS has been excluded from the negotiation uh, talks. And this is a question which will have to be answered in the end. Um, my political group hasn't 
discussed this question yet in detail because we don't know what the compromise could be and we don't know what exactly the negotiators will propose. But you need a majority for TTIP in the European Parliament. And you will only get a majority for the, in the European Parliament for TTIP if the Social Democratic group, if the Social Democrats agree as well. Because, first of all, the EPP, my group, and the Social Democrats have agreed in all major issues we will always vote together because we need a solid majority so the Commission can work. Um, so we need the Social Democrats. And the question of ISDS has raised a lot of concern within the socialist group, um, and especially within the German socialists. You know that um, in Germany we have a grand coalition between the CDU and the Social Democrats. And Mr. Gabriel, our Vice Chancellor and uh, Minister for Economics, um, is fighting an uphill battle in his party. Uh, I mean, TTIP isn't very popular within the German Social Democrats, but he's still convinced that he's on the right path and he's working and encouraging his party to move forward. However, um, the Social Democrats are rather clear that ISDS uh, uh, um, uh, won't, uh, it won't go through as some people expect uh, here in Washington. Perhaps we might have to just wait and see what happens to the Canadian trade agreement. I mean, we have rules and regulations on this issue in the Canadian agreement, and perhaps um, that might be a way we can also find a compromise for the um, TTIP. Uh, once again, I'm not a German socialist. Uh, you'd have to invite somebody, for instance, our Minister for Justice, Mr. Maas, or somebody else to explain you to explain to you why uh, not only the German socialists but other socialists are so very concerned. Um, so we have one here and then one in the back. And then um, by the way, it's not in the European Parliament which will have to pass TTIP. Uh, probably all the 28 member states will also have to agree within their parliaments and uh, that means not only one parliament for each 28 member states but for instance, in Germany, we're not only talking about the Bundestag, we're also talking about our second chamber, the Bundesrat. And in the moment, uh, the, a coalition between the CDU and the SPD wouldn't even have a majority in the Bundesrat. It was the Green Party would have to also approve. And, but these are questions we will have to answer when they have to be answered. So perhaps in two or three years' time? I don't know. Yes. Hi, I'm Carl Lankowski, uh, Foreign Service Institute, Department of State. So uh, you began talking about the political dynamics within the European Parliament, uh, and I'd like to pursue that a little bit, um, not with TTIP, uh, but with the Ukraine question. You mentioned in your uh, former remarks uh, that uh, Europe was open for business when it came to uh, reaching out to other countries that were willing to uh, and oriented to European ideals, uh, what do you do when uh, a million people appear on the Euromaidan uh, wanting to become part of Europe uh, and at the same time have a, uh, an aggression that can't even speak its name uh, from Russia? Um, how, does, how does that look within the European Parliament right now? Can you give us a sense of the balance of forces and the dynamics on that issue? An enlargement fatigue is noticeable throughout the whole of the 28 member states. Um, it varies from country to country, but um, when Mr. Juncker said no further accessions to the European Union within the next five years, he will certainly have the majority of Europeans uh, uh, behind him. Um, I mean, the enlargement process of the European Union in the last years was just enormous. And, um, you know, Romania and Bulgaria showed us all elements, all the criteria elements have to be completely fulfilled, not only in pa on paper, but in reality. Uh, and it, it, it's, it's, not, it's of no help at all, neither for the European Union nor for new member states, 
to let them join the European Union uh, as long as the criteria isn't actually fulfilled. So that's why Montenegro and Serbia are going through a very tough negotiation process. But it might be, well, it will be for the benefit of but for both sides. Um, I think we've got to stop the discussion in Europe. You're either in or out. But there must be a third way to have countries who are in Europe and who are interested in cooperating more closely with the European Union uh, to get them closer to the EU without them getting me full members. And that's what, all that, that's what neighborhood policy is about. That's why we have agree agreed these uh, stabilization and cooperation agreements with Georgia, with Moldova, with Ukraine. Uh, once again, um, in the end, the European Union will finally need borders. Uh, and uh, we've got to draw the borders somewhere. But uh, that's why I know that EU membership of Ukraine is an issue which is perhaps more popular in Romania or Poland. But that is not the issue we're talking about uh, in Western Europe in the moment. And this is a b debate we shouldn't be actually uh, having now. I in the moment, it's more important for us to help Ukraine uh, uh, recover, help them do their economic reforms and bring them as closely as possible to the European Union. Sir in the back. Thank you very much. My name is Robert Benjamin. I'm with the National Democratic Institute, just following if I can on enlargement and just pressing a little bit on the politics because I am left wondering how you sell enlargement to domestic publics that may not, 1989 is 25 years past and the economic uh, narrative of such, at least for the Balkans, is maybe not so obvious because the markets are relatively small and you're confronted with the immediate question of internal EU migration, which we've seen last week in Britain, is really a political difficulty. Mr. Juncker's statement is self-evident, but it also could be read as providing some political cover. How do you establish the narrative uh, over the next few years for, for domestic consumption along those lines? And if I can, in the other direction, the, the whole question of criteria is obviously very critical, uh, and you have um, countries that are seeking to meet the Copenhagen political criteria, but at the same time when there are, are questions within the EU about member states being able to either meet the criteria or distance themselves somewhat from the criteria, does that provide any drag somehow with your engagement of, of prospective, uh, prospective member states? Thank you. I was appointed as standing rapporteur for Serbia a few weeks ago, and since then I've been talking to my uh, people in Germany about this question. What we have got to do as politicians responsible for further enlargement, we don't only have to tell countries like Serbia or Montenegro or others that it's a big benefit to join the European Union, but of course we also have to tell our people in the member states that they also benefit. And I would always say to, to the Germans, the first thing is we can't be arrogant. We can't say this is it. The Western Balkans are in the heart of Europe. The second thing I always say is we have a special responsibility for the Western Balkans. from a historic point of view. The third thing is, if we want stability, long-term stability and process, uh, long-term stability and peace in the Western Balkans, the European perspective is of vital importance. I mean, it was Kathy Ashton and her team. And the Americans did their job too. But it was Kathy Ashton and, their, and her team which actually made Pristina and Belgrade start to talk with each other. I mean, there was a terrible war just a few years ago. And it was, you know, NATO airplanes bombed Belgrade. And if 10, 15 years later, <coughs> we've got Serbs and people from Kosovo officials talking to each other. And that's got a lot to do with the pressure which was put up by Brussels and, you know, and that's why Uncle Merkel is so strongly committed that the first chapter 
with Serbia will only be opened if we start seeing concrete results on the normalization of the relationship between Kosovo and Serbia. So I always argue, first of all, we've got a responsibility for the Balkans. The Western Balkans have a clear European perspective, and it's got a lot to do with peace and stability, one hour's flight from Munich. I mean, we're not talking about Central Africa or, or some other part. Way away. It's in the heart of Europe. And German soldiers were also involved, uh, also involved uh, in the, uh, after the, 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 the terrible uh, incidents that happened. And of course, Serbia or Montenegro or other countries would be a valuable contribution to European culture, to the European economy. I mean, we're talking about 8 million people in Serbia. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, foreign investment in Serbia already. And of course, uh, 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 we would also benefit from Europeans moving to Serbia, but of course, Serbian people moving to, to Europe. I mean, Vienna is the third largest Serbian city in the world, uh, after Belgrade and Chicago, <laughs> uh, 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 yeah, I was told. So that's, um, and please bear in mind, uh, new member states of the European Union require a treaty amendment and uh, perhaps even a referendum in some of the countries. I think it's a good move that Johannes Hahn, an Austrian, is the new commissioner responsible for enlargement and neighborhood policy because the Austrians have close historic ties to the countries on the Balkans. Yes, ma'am in the front. Thank you, Mr. McAllister. Heather Conley with the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, speaking of commissioners, the German commissioner, Mr. Ettinger, is a commissioner for the digital agenda. Yes. And on Thursday, we had an extraordinary statement from the European Parliament about Google and the unbundling of Google. I'm wondering if, and we had a reaction to that uh, statement here in Washington. Uh, could you share with us the <laughs> data protection environment in the European Parliament from, uh, it's a competitiveness question, it's a data privacy question and we'd love your thoughts and I'm sure you'll get a few questions about that on Capitol Hill tomorrow. I knew you would ask this question. Uh, look, I, I'm not an e expert on the digital single market. Uh, I'm more into foreign affairs and enlargement but this is the famous resolution which was carried by the Strasbourg Parliament and I got a number of letters from my American counterparts before and I read a lot in the American media I think the American public has hardly ever paid such big attention to the European Parliament, so we must be more important than some people think we are. Uh, however, first of all, I read the whole resolution flying, um, not before we passed it, but afterwards. <laughs> no, uh, of course I read it beforehand, but I read it once again, word for word, flying to Washington from Frankfurt on Sunday evening. And the, first of all, the word Google doesn't appear once in this resolution. If you find the word Google, I'll pay you whatever you want. <laughs> and uh, now, and I mean, I'll just try and read out what exactly the European Parliament meant. We say the European Parliament stresses the need to ensure a level playing field for companies operating in the digital single market in order for them to be able to compete. That's nothing special. Then the European Parliament notes that a level playing field for companies in the digital single market must be ensured in order to guarantee a vibrant digital economy in the EU. Then going further into detail, which was probably noted with biggest concern in the American public, the European Parliament notes that the online search market is of particular importance in ensuring competitive conditions within the digital single market given the potential development of search engines into gatekeepers and the possibilities they have of commercializing secondary exploitation of information obtained. And then finally, the European Parliament stresses that when using search engines, the search process and results should be unbiased in order to keep internet searches non-discriminatory to ensure more competition and choice for users and consumers and to maintain the diversity of sources of information. And on and on. So that's really... The situation we have in Europe is that Google, for instance in Germany, has a market share of about 
Now, Germans choose this on a voluntary basis. Uh, there are other search engines, but they go to, well, I always go pick Google because I don't know how to change it, my computer, but, uh, but uh, <laughs> no, I, I'm always on, I, no, I'm always on, yeah, but I, 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 I'm with the 93% majority. I, I, I wish my political party had 93%, <laughs> uh, but we're still far away from that. So <laughs> it's okay that, 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 that Google has this market share, but once again, uh, we don't want, we want an, it shouldn't be unbiased, unbiased in order to keep internet searches non-discriminatory. Mm -hmm. And that's what the European Parliament has addressed. This was passed by, what was it, 450 votes or something? Can I have it? Oh, I actually, there's a picture of, of the, re what it, it was carried by 384 to 174. My God, where was the rest? Uh, well, anyhow, 384 to 174, and this is, it's just a non-legislative draft, it's a proposal, and it's got nothing to do with the European Commission having a closer look at the, the kartellrechtliche Verfahren in German. What's that in English? Uh? Yeah, exactly. They're completely independent, but, uh, you know, please understand, um, I know that, you know, American colleagues wrote me letters and said, look, we're under pressure from Google and we've got serious concerns here and so on. Please bear in mind, um, there are also German media enterprises who have their concerns and they're also addressing their members of parliament in Strasbourg. So, I mean, I don't want to advise anybody, but in general I would say perhaps we can both calm down on both <laughs> sides of the Atlantic, cool down and uh, I think this is a very fair and balanced resolution, and that's why I voted in favor of. And I think that's a great place to stop. We actually, unfortunately, are out of time. Oh, are we? <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. This is the fourth installment of the Transatlantic Talk at the German Marshall Fund, the new European Parliament and the Atlantic, Opportunities and Challenges for EU-US Cooperation. I'm Molly McCluskey, here with David McAllister. Thank you so much. Okay.